in January of 1971 came the day when we set sail. Bang! Bang, bang! And the whole boat jarred in the water. We are sinking. Abandoned ship. We would die together. We would not eat each other. We would not drink each other's blood. From the dolphins that we caught, we emptied their bellies and ate the food that they'd ate. I said, it is a ship, Dad. It's a ship. So we flares. We better get the flares ready. For us, it meant life. That we were going to su survive, at least. In today's world, there are so many incredible and extraordinary stories of survival. Stories about fighting against the odds, overcoming the toughest situations and never giving up. Stories that need to be told and heard. Stories that can change our perspective on life, offer us empowerment, teach us how to deal with difficulties and give us inspiration to find inner strength. My name is Iris Sentoven and you're now listening to They Survived. This week I am talking to Douglas Robertson, whose boat was attacked by a school of killer whales while making a world trip with his family. This created a harrowing experience of survival, lasting 38 days in an inflatable rubber raft with barely any food or drinking water. They battled against 20-foot waves, marauding sharks, thirst, starvation, exhaustion and found an incredible will to live. So welcome Douglas and thank you for joining the podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. I think the first thing to do is give a little bit of context before uh, this happened. So could you tell me a little bit about your life uh, yeah, before you went on this adventurous trip? Well, we're winding the clock back now some way to, um, well, first my mum and dad uh, married in Hong Kong in the 1950s, 1952. And they, they were, she was a nurse and my dad was the sea captain. Mm -hmm. So they lived that professional life. And then for reasons which nobody can fathom or understand, they gave up that comfortable life to become farmers in England, in the middle of England. And they, they bought a farm and that's where we were born. Mm -hmm. So we were born as farmers in the 1950s. The 1960s, grew up through the 1960s, and uh, farming is a hard life, especially hill farming. The farm wasn't doing great, and uh, we lived in a small village in the middle of England, and we were brought up in a rural, a rural countryside upbringing. And um, my father always thought that we were very sheltered. We lived a very sheltered life. In 1968, there was a round the world yacht race. And uh, Robin Knox Johnson won the round the world yacht race. He was a sea captain. And my younger brother said, innocently, because we, we, all, we all used to meet up on Sunday mornings in my parents' bed, basically. So the whole family was in the, in the bed with them. Mm -hmm. And we'd talk about the stuff, you know, maybe how school was going or how the harvest was going or the dog, you know, or whatever. And Neil said, we were talking about the conversation turned to um, this race, round the world yacht race. And Neil said, my younger brother, who's a young twin, said, uh, Daddy's a sailor, why don't we sail round the world? Hmm. Now, that wasn't meant to be a serious comment, yes. right? But my dad did take it very seriously because he, he thought, well, why not? You know, I'm a master mariner. I'm not a very good farmer maybe now is the time. So he took it serious. He took it seriously. And uh, he said it would be a good idea. Okay. Might be a good idea. What was your reaction? Well, I, I didn't, didn't have a reaction as such. I was always going to be a farmer. And I just didn't believe it would ever happen. So why get excited about something that's never going to happen? But it did happen. And... Uh, Doodle sold the farm. Doodle's your dad? My dad, yeah. yeah. He sold the farm, bought a yacht, and suddenly, like these things, you know, they never happen forever, and then suddenly we were presented with this opportunity to sail around the world. What was the opportunity? Well, the opportunity was that we had, we'd sold the farm and bought a boat, so yeah. I, there was no way I could be a farmer without a farm. <laughs> 
I, I was happy, secretly happy. How old were you at this age? I was age? 16. 16. And you had I, two I, younger brothers? Yeah, two younger brothers who were tw uh, 11. Yes. Uh, and uh, they, they, my sister, who was older, one year, one and a half years older. And, you know, we, we were due to have ordinary lives. And we were going to go to university or get jobs. Or so I was going to be a farmer. And um, I was I used to drive the tractor and milk the cows and do all those sorts of jobs. The, the, the twins were kind of innocent. They thought, yeah, we'll sail around the world, yeah, mm -hmm. whatever that means, you know, we'll do that. And my mother was always very, very cautious, saying, well, you know, we've had fun, we've discussed this little dream, let's stop discussing it now and start thinking about serious matters. But somehow talk never went away about this fantasy trip around the world, you know. And then, as I say, one day through the post came a letter from a yacht broker and they'd misspelt the pronunciation. It said, a world gurgler. Now, he meant to say a world girdler. Oh, yes. Meaning to girdle, to go around the world. Gurgler, of course, means to sink, right? <laughs> that was a sign. <laughs> and, yeah, yes, it was a sort of prophetic statement, yes. you know. And we were laughed at this. But in actual fact, the, the boat seemed to match our needs. You've got to bear in mind that we sold the farm for £8,000 and we bought this yacht for £3,000. All right. But the boat was in Malta and she had to be sailed back to England for reasons that I just cannot understand. Why didn't we all just go to Malta <laughs> and set sail from Malta? But no, Dougal had it in his head that we should bring the boat back to Falmouth and set sail from Falmouth. I then just go back over the area that we'd just come, yes. you know, sail through. But I don't doubt they had their reasons somehow. Uh, my sister and my father went to Malta and got some crew and sailed the boat back. Pretty horrendous trip in the winter, sorry, late summer of 1970. Uh, we we uh, did some repairs on the on the yacht, and we got used to the yacht. We were farmers, you know, and yes. now suddenly we were in a small boat with uh, all kinds of cleats and uh, fair leads and you know halyards and cross trees and stays and sheets. And we didn't know what we were talking about. You know, this, this was a new language to us. And we had to learn about this environment that we were found ourselves in. Do you think you all were like well trained enough to go no. on a trip like this? No, absolutely not. Okay. You, you know, we did not even. We were in Falmouth for three months or four months. We did not once even sail round the bay oh on the yacht God. before we set off around the world. And... You know, it's only in my later life that I stop and think, why was that? Why didn't Dougal just train us a little bit? You know, wh why did he make this sort of absurd decision to sail around the world and take his family? Who does that, <laughs> you know? But then why did they make the decision to give up a, a, gr a good life in Hong Kong to come and become farmers in, a, in, a, in the hills, in the Pennines, in the middle of England. Why did they do that, you know? So maybe they were always very adventurous in their hearts, you know? We sold it to a, an English farmer who was uh, expanding his uh, business. At what moment your father really decided to go? No, 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 no. There was still a big hurdle to, to beat. You know, you never really take anything seriously until the moment <laughs> it is about to happen. So it was before, like... And in November, my mum and dad had this huge argument about whether they should go or not. Me and my sister, I mean, we were only young, but we knew that we had to leave them on the boat alone to sort of decide whether this was actually going to happen or not. And we figured, we went and stayed in a hotel, a bed and breakfast that night, and we figured if when we went back in the morning, if they were smiling, then it was going to happen. And if they were angry with each other, then probably we weren't going to sail around the world after all. But were you excited to sail around the world? This, or yes. Did you well, I'll, tell you how, I'll tell you how excited I was. Because it's only in later life that you can weigh up 
measure excitement. My godfather lived in the farm next door. And he was my godfather because I was born in the middle of a snowstorm and I nearly died of pneumonia. So I had to be christened twice. Mm -hmm. I had to be christened at home in case I died. And because he was the next door neighbor, he, he became my godfather. <laughs> right? And he, he, he didn't have children of his own. And he said to me when I was, told him that we were going to sail around the world, he said, Douglas, you do not need to do this. He said, I'll tell you what. Me and Amy have no children of our own. He says, but if you come and live here and help me farm, I will give you the farm as an inheritance. And I said to him, no, John, I want to sail around the world with my dad. So when I look back at it, I must have really <laughs> wanted to sail Sarah around the does. world, yeah. you know, because I gave up that opportunity to have my own farm yeah. uh, uh, in order to sail around the world. Yeah, but so. it does sound... Excited. Yes, it sounds yeah. exciting, especially to a farmer, farmer's yeah. son, you know, knew nothing of the world. And um, so the truth of the matter, the real truth of the matter is in January of 1971 came the day when we set sail because to sail around the world. Your parents were smiling that morning. So yeah, you well, decided they had to been go. smiling and they said, <laughs> we are going. Oh, my God. So we now knew that we were definitely going to sail around the world. You would have thought that Dougal would have said, right, so we're going to start by doing a bit of training. No, 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 no. Training on the job. Dougal said you train on the job, which means you may you find it out as you go. Anyway, came that morning, the wind. The wind was then very unkind to us, and it, it blew out of the south. It blew, blew out of the south for about six weeks which means that we, we were locked into Falmouth. We couldn't set sail from Falmouth because the wind is coming up from the south. And then one day, late in January, during that time, after we had decided we were definitely going to sail around the world, uh, my mum and dad's uh, argument had been sort of clarified, we met an Icelandic family who came into the harbour and dropped anchor. This was a family we were going to get to know very well. And indeed, a family to which we would owe our lives in the fullness of time. And uh, they were, you know, they, Siggy and Etta, they had uh, six children, I think wow. six. We had four children, we were all the same sort of age, and we all got on well together, and we were all, they were also sailing around the world. And um, we decided that we would keep in touch as we sailed around the world. He was a sea captain, an Icelandic sea captain, My dad was a sea captain. And um, I remember them, uh, Siggy coming over one day and saying, Dougal, the wind is about to change. If we're going to go, now is the time to go. And so suddenly everything was a rush. We had to top the water tanks up, top the diesel tanks up. Uh, and and you know, we got moving on the boat for the first time. And I can't remember the date now, I'm sorry to say, but late in January 1971, we set sail for Lisbon mm -hmm. and around the world. Dougal was at the wheel, stamping his feet and saying, yee-haw. <laughs> so I think after all of that, it was Dougal who wanted to sail around the world. He just All the rest of it was just excuses. He wanted to go, and he was the happiest of us all to be going. Yes. And so suddenly we were on our way. Uh, we, 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 we left the Bay of Falmouth, and I, I always remember the very first wave that rolled over, rolled up to the Lucette, hit the bow, spray, sprayed, and we burst into spray, and this cold spray came over the boat and hit me straight in the face, you know. And I thought, suddenly it was not so romantic anymore. You know, I, I suddenly realized, hang on a minute, this is, uh, this is worse than I thought, and the waves are huge, you know. And um, so I, I was to be given a baptism of fire as we set sail from, uh, from Falmouth. So how were the first days? Was well, it... The first days were terrible. Oh. So they, 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 uh, I always remember that first night. You know you have distress rockets? Mm-hmm. And uh, my mother said to my dad, Dougal, can we send up the rockets now? And my dad said to her, Linda, don't be silly. Only a bloody fool would be out in weather like this. 
Mm. To which my mother said, exactly. I, you know, you are the bloody <laughs> fool for being out in this weather. You know, the, 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 the boat, it was a very heavy weather. That, so that northerly wind became a um, full whole gale. Yes. Veer to the right, back to, back to the west. And, uh, you know, there was only me and my dad who were able to steer the boat. And uh, she made water through the wooden planks. And we thought we'd made a huge mistake. You know, we were we were sailing in very heavy weather under bare poles, I no sails up. We, uh, me and my dad did four on four off watch keeping. Were you seasick um, at those? Yeah, very the first seasick. Times very, very this weather seasick. Should have been very seasick. Very yeah. tough. And uh, we decided to hell with this. When we get to Falmouth, we're selling the boat and going back home. Yeah. That's it. There was a plan, like it was a plan, a new plan. Yes. This was. The plan was that that plan wasn't a very good plan to sail around the world. We couldn't take much of this, mm -hmm. much more of this. After 10 days, we got into Falmouth. Actually, we got into uh, uh, Lisbon, sailed up the river and uh, docked in, in the uh, uh, Vasco de Gar uh, Henry the Navigator uh, Marina. And we were tied up in this quiet water and the sun came out. We dried, the boat dried throughout. We thought, you know, it's not really a very bad idea. You know? <laughs> Let's continue with the plan. <laughs> yeah. Let's go on to Canary Islands and see how that goes. Uh -huh. We'll make the decision in the Canaries. Yes. That's what we thought. So we stayed there for about 10 days in, in Lisbon, uh, repaired the sails and did a few minor repairs. And then we set sail to the Canary Islands. And, and the sea was flat, calm. The sunsets were glorious. The dolphins swam around us, and I think it was on that leg that we became uh, hooked into, uh, it didn't matter what happened, as long as the Lucette mm -hmm. could take us, the boat could take us. Lucette we, is the name of the, the boat, Lucette yes. Lucette is the name of the boat. We would, uh, we would carry on around, the and we would get, sail around the world. Yeah. This was our mission. And um, maybe a week after that, we, we, we hit... Uh, Gran, Gran Canaria, mm -hmm. uh, Las Palmas in Gran Canaria, along with all the other ships. And, 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 and lo and behold, who was there but the Icelandic boat was there uh, uh, waiting for us. Sort of the plan had come together, if you like. And so we set sail. We knew we were going to set sail then across the Atlantic, up through the Caribbean, we wintered that time, that year in uh, Miami, Florida. So how did you fund this trip? From our savings. And we worked. When we got to Miami, we had three US dollars to our name. That was it. Okay. Right. But the wind is free. So we didn't have to buy diesel. And uh, we, 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 so we could go for a long time without money. But we didn't have much money by this time. I worked. I did gardening jobs and yacht delivery jobs and... Um, other jobs that I got paid for. So at every stop you at every stop, worked you know, for so a couple of days. It wasn't always above board, you know, yeah. work visa and all that sort of thing. But uh, they, they, um, we gathered money together. And, and we'd had one or two sort of equipment failures on the way, mm -hmm. which had cost all our savings, really. We got to Miami with just $3 to our name, but I got a job gardening straight away. It doesn't sound very much nowadays, but I, I used to earn $10 a day gardening okay. oh, and, and polishing boats. Yeah. But that was a lot of money in those days when and we didn't really have any costs. And then my dad got work and my mum got work as a nurse. And suddenly we'd saved up enough money to finance the next leg to Australia and New Zealand. Perfect. And so we, we self-funded as we went, basically. Through, through getting work. We, we thought we would get work in Australia and New Zealand too. And with that, we could pay for the leg back up to um, England, back to England. And that was going to be four years away. So we, we anticipated taking four years out to do this trip. We set sail from Miami, then went down through the Windward Passage. Uh, I am leaving a lot of things out here just to get, to get on with this story, but um, we had lots of adventures. My sister left us. She found somebody and uh, fell in love with him. Where was this? This is in uh, Nassau, New Providence, in the Bahamas. Okay. She fell in and love with... She fell in love with... With who? Well, on our trip through the Caribbean, we came across a fishing boat in distress. 
and we rescued the fishermen on that fishing boat and brought them back to Nassau in the Bahamas. And one of the wealthy inhabitants of Nassau saw this and invited us to um, a meal at his house, splendid house on the waterfront. Uh, as a thank you. As a thank you. Mm -hmm. And he said it was from the community of Nassau for saving these fishermen, Al although they didn't know them, but they were their own fishermen, five of them. His son was there. All and, right. And that's where my sister met him. And, you know, their eyes met. They, she said she was not going to continue, that she was going to stay there with Jeff. I cannot believe, I've got children of my own now, I cannot believe that my mum and dad actually did that. And they left Anne oh. in Nassau. And don't forget, in those days, there was no telephones. Yes. There was not even a jet. They hadn't even flown across the Atlantic at that time. So um, the, the, she was isolated. There was only letters. But they did. They left her there. How old was she? She, she would have been 18, maybe. 18. 18 years yes. old. But I think... I think 18 was more like 16 in this day and age. You know, it, it was very innocent. The world was very innocent in those times. But we carried on. Yeah. We uh, continued with the we trip. We continued with yes. the trip. And we took a passenger, Jamaica, and we charged him. So we, we generated some cash from um, renting out her berth, if you like. As a sort of hitchhiker. A hitchhiker, okay. yeah. Okay. What so was he, his purpose? of the, just? He wanted just to... We were going to the San Blas Islands. All right. The San Blas Islands are very difficult to get to. And uh, we said we would go there. What was the name of the hitchhiker? His name was Scott Tread. Scott. Scott. And his dad was a yacht designer. All right. And they lived in Jamaica. So, and Anne left and you continued the trip with and another we, passenger. We, yeah, yeah, we had another person. So there. it was now you, your and, parents, the twins and... And Scott. And Scott. Scott went home. Along came a fresh-faced... Englishman, who was uh, had had a sort of a privileged uh, upbringing here in the UK. I'm not sure he would say that, mm -hmm. but to us he was quite posh, he was a well-spoken young man, and he was looking for a trip to New Zealand, and he'd heard on the grapevine that we were going to New Zealand, and uh, he, he asked if he could come along and he would pay his passage. All right. And so his name was Robin Williams. And he was with us as we crossed the Pacific Ocean. So in Panama, the final group of people had assembled for the next leg to Australia and New Zealand. Yes. That, that's what had happened there. That was your so, parents, the twins, yeah, and Robin. Robin and, and myself. Yeah. Yes. And my dad did some work on the dinghy. He, he converted it to um, a sailing boat. It was just a rowing boat, but he converted it to a sailing boat. And I will just mention this point as well when we were cruising up to the caribbean we went to a place called um uh, Bakui, which is in the grenadine section of, uh, of the caribbean it was there that sigi the icelander gave my father the life raft and dougal wouldn't take it of course he said no sigi we won't need a life raft we we, we have the dinghy and we have uh, we have the lucette what better lifeboat could you have than the boat you're on? You know, we might lose a mast, we might go aground, but we can stay on it until we get rescued. So we won't need a, a life raft. And and Siggy said to Dougal, a word, words that I have often quoted to my children. Yes. It's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So you're taking it. And he insisted. Little he did said, he know, yeah. You do it for the children, Dougal. You do it for your children. So we took the life raft, and in Miami, when we'd stayed in Miami quite a long while, the Icelanders could not afford to carry on because their boat was a diesel a diesel boat and fuel was expensive. And so they decided to sell up. They sold their boat, emigrate, basically emigrated to America, went to live in Fort Lauderdale. And so we carried on alone from Miami. We were no longer with the Icelanders. And that's when we sort of started to take passengers to help pay the way. We set sail through the Panama Canal and uh, we sailed onto the Galapagos through... Um, it took us about 10 days, maybe two weeks to get to the Galapagos. And two events happened that uh, stuck in our memory. First of all, we had a very large whale try to make love to the boat. Because he thought... She yeah. thought. 
She it thought was it was a, a wheel as well. A whale. And she <laughs> rubbed herself up against the against the boat, actually contacted with the boat. You know, it's scary because, you know, the boat was being yes. moved by an external force. And also, we sailed through the doldrums and it rained miserably for five or six days, heavy rain that we just thought, God, when will this finish, you know? And of course it did, and we sailed on to the Galapagos and we got there. And we cruised the Galapagos for about three weeks and went and saw the magnificence of those islands. But nothing happened to the boat when the wheel made no, love? No, no, no. Okay. So no, nothing. But no. it was a sign that... But it was a, Well, we didn't know it was a sign. Yes. We didn't know what was to come. We, but it was a sign that we must have looked like a whale from underneath the water. Uh-huh. Because later on, yes. killer whales were to see us as another whale, maybe... Yes. Nobody knows why, but we, we sailed around the, the Galapagos and the very last person we met before we took off for Marquesa Islands, which was nearly 2,000 miles away, uh, uh, off to the west, was a young lady who was doing a PhD in biology mm -hmm. and she her subject was whales, so she was an expert on whales, yeah? and she said that, in her opinion, whales would never attack we told her about this this whale that you know she said well, i don't understand why they would do that whales do, would never attack a yacht and we thought well if she's got a phd she must know what she's talking about you will believe her you know yeah of course yeah. yeah so anyway we set sail i don't know why we were talking about that subject we we're having a campfire and uh, some we'd caught some fish tuna fish and some barracuda and uh, we were eat, cooking that on the beach and uh, this was to be our last night ashore before we set sail for Marquesas. Marquesas were at least 45 days away. So it be the longest leg of the passage of our round-the-world trip. We went across to Fernandina, the island of Fernandina. It was just a volcano, basically, a fuming volcano. We went up to, up to it and climbed back down again. And we were it took a lot longer than we thought. So we set sail a bit late in the day from uh, Fernandina. We weren't going to make a get out of the channel before nightfall, so we went to a special place, which is a sort of a cove deep in the uh, Isabella Island. When we woke up in the morning, the names of sailing ships were painted on the cliffs, going back like a hundred years. Mm -hmm. We'd stumbled on this very special cove. I climbed the cliff and wrote the name Lucette on the wall there, on the cliff wall. And uh, we set sail about 10 o'clock that morning and we cleared the Cape of West, West Espinosa, which is the point mm -hmm. of uh, Isabella Island, and we set sail for um, the Marquesa Islands. Robin had never sailed before, Robin Williams, and he was still coming to terms with how to sail the boat. We were experienced, well-experienced sailors by then. We'd yes. been sailing for two years. You know, we were one with our environment. And... Um, came the morning of the 15th of June, 1972. The, I had been up during the night with sail changes and things like that, and um, my brother Sandy was on the wheel, and uh, I, I woke probably 9, 9.30. Dool had taken a morning sight with his sextant, put the sextant back in the box for safekeeping, and he had all his uh, papers. We're talking about celestial navigation here. Mm -hmm. There was no GPS in those yes. days. so. And he had all his uh, papers, working papers, out on the on the desk. And he thought he would put a coffee on. Having taken his sight, you can relax a bit. You know, it's a bit stressful to get in the sight. You've got to get the sight and the exact time. And then you've got to write that down. And then you do the same again. So you take two two observations, write them down, and then you can have a put the sextant away. Yeah. And you can just relax a bit and nothing's going to get broken. Little did he know then that uh, he was never going to drink that coffee. Nobody was to know what was to happen over the next minute or so. But I was up on the, on the, in the cockpit with uh, uh, my brother Sandy. He was 12, 12 and a half by now. And we had a squid on the end of the fishing line. We'd caught a squid with our big eyes, you know. Mm -hmm. Of course, Douglas, who knows everything about everything, says, well, you know what? The whales eat squids and... Wherever you find squid, you always find something bigger. All right. So little did I know what I was saying. 
And then I just caught out of the corner of my eye a little black mark. It wasn't a bird. It was too solid to be a bird. I didn't know what it was. So it looks like a fin. Fin of a fin, but it's bloody big if it's a fin. Didn't pay a second thought to it. Returned to talk to Sandy about the squid. And I said, look, we'll just we'll take it off the hook because we're not going to catch anything else with that on. You know. Then, bang, bang, bang. And the whole boat jarred in the water. And I, I couldn't think for what, what might have happened. I thought we must have gone aground. But we're 200 miles out in the Pacific Ocean. That's not possible. I, I, I poked my head down below and uh, I, I said, Dad. And I could see he was up to his ankles in water. No. And I said, what? Because, you know, petulant teenager. I said, what are you doing? And he said, where's this water coming from? And then I heard this big noise behind me. I turned my head and there were three killer whales. For, for the sake of that uh, visual story, a daddy one, a baby one in between, and a mummy one beyond, like a, a, a large whale baby yes. whale and a two-thirds size whale With beyond it three of them attacking the boats no no, oh. no this was a this was a daddy Protecting. a baby and a, a mummy but the daddy had his head split wide open and blood was pouring into the water so I, he had definitely hit the hit the boat so i poked my head back down the hatch to tell dougal my dad that i'd seen these whales you know dougal was now up to his waist in water and water was in the furniture, in the drawers, and in the, you know, and it, it still didn't dawn on me that this, that we were sinking. And Dougal looked up at me and, and he said, we are sinking, abandon ship. And I said, Dougal, abandon ship to where exactly? You know, I said, we're not in Miami Marina now, we're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And he said, abandon, over there. Abandoned ship over there. He meant in the sea over there. Get the life raft over the side, Douglas, and prepare to abandon ship. And I thought, this is not happening. This cannot be happening. I went forward. I thought, I know, I'm dreaming. I'll take the sails down. And when I wake up, everything will be all right. So I'll start to take the sails down. Now, Dougal sort of disappeared for about a minute. So I went forward and I took the number one jib down. And then suddenly Dougal appeared. He says, what the hell are you doing, Douglas? Get the life raft over the side. I just snapped into action. I've got the life raft over the side. I put the dinghy over the side. I put the oars into the dinghy. I tied the dinghy to the rail. And I threw the raft over the side. I started to pull on the inflation cord. And I pulled and I pulled. It was 80 feet long. And I pulled and eventually I, it came to a stop. Mm -hmm. and I yanked it like that and this raft started to inflate and we looked at it it was like our saviour if that raft had not inflated we would have all died right there you know and it gradually inflated I, I got washed off the deck I was in the water now and the killer whales were still there but they were holding back they must have been as confused as we were about what had happened you know and um my brother did see them swimming around. I didn't see any of them at the time, but I was very concerned about keeping the raft afloat because it was leaking and it was making a loud noise. And I thought, I've got to stop that leak. I grabbed hold of the raft. But, you know, this is um, a story where two bad things make a good thing. Mm -hmm. you know? The wind was quite strong. It was about four or six and uh, it was blowing the raft away. Oh, no. From the, from the site of the shipwreck. And uh, the others were not on it yet. And Robin, the student, got into the dinghy the wrong way round and sank the dinghy alongside the Lucette. That sounds like a bad thing. But in actual fact, Dougal took the rope of the dinghy and tied it to the raft. And because the dinghy was now full of water, it held the raft in the right place for everybody to get on. Yes. So kind of a bit of misfortune turned into a bit of good fortune. Otherwise, the raft would have been blown away and we would never have got on it. So first of all, the raft had inflated. Second of all is that we'd managed to uh, then get on board. My mum and myself were the last ones to get on. But did you uh, took some stuff on board? Where, uh, was there we, time we, left? We, we didn't have time. Okay. 
you know, we had prepared stuff and painstakingly checked it on every voyage except this one. Oh, no. And we thought, we need water because it's a long trip. Yes. So what we'll do is we'll empty the survival kit that we had prepared and fill the bucket with water because the water would be more valuable. So there was no rescue stuff to There was no rescue stuff you. and we lost the buckets with right. the water anyway. My mum, uh, when she got married in Hong Kong, my dad bought her a pearl necklace or a wedding present and she took it with her around the world. When, when we were uh, abandoning the Lucette, you have to bear in mind that she sank in two minutes, so very little time. She pulled the drawer open and looked in there and saw her pearls there and she said, well... And there was a bag of onions there. And she said, well, they came from the sea. They can go back to the sea. And she took the onions instead because she recognised the onions would be of greater value to us in the world we were about to go to yes. than the world we were coming from. So the only thing you had was a sack We had of a onions. bag of onions. And, and the thing about the oranges, the oranges were floating in the sea and we managed to collect them. Ah. And I... I remember having this bizarre conversation with my mother in the middle of the water. We were both swimming next to the raft and it was leaking. As I said, the, the, the carbon the dioxide leaking, was yeah. leaking. And I, I said to my mother, I need a patch to fix this leak with. I said, have you got anything? Now, you've got to bear in mind, she's in her nightdress in the, swimming in the Pacific Ocean. Crazy. And I'm asking her if she's got anything, you know, that I can fix this hole with. And she passed me an orange. Yes. And she said, will this do? And I looked at this orange, I thought, I don't know how the hell I'm going to fix that leak. Anyway, the fact of the matter is that life rafts are, have enough CO2 in them to inflate in the Antarctic and the Arctic regions, so they have an excess in the tropics. Uh, and it was the excess that was bleeding off the raft. It didn't have a hole in it. It was, it was just, just like repairing it was itself. Just, it was just letting off excess CO2. So it, it was a good thing that it was you a didn't thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah, that I didn't yeah. stop it because it might have... Burst it, you know. Uh, I understand. But what happened was, um, you can imagine, in just a few minutes, just within a few minutes, we had uh, boarded the life raft. Yeah. And I was the last one to get onto the life raft. And the killer wheels were still swimming there? Or were they, they left? They'd gone by then. Okay. They'd gone. And we don't know what happened to them. But we know one of them was badly damaged. And why wouldn't they look after that one? Why wouldn't they? And maybe the other ones were damaged too. Mm -hmm. We were hit three times. They didn't come after us. That was our greatest fear, was that we were going to be eaten alive. And and I kept on feeling for my legs because I heard that you don't feel it. You just see the blood mm -hmm. and you haven't got any legs, you know. And I kept feeling around there, thinking, well, I've still got my bloody legs, you know, so they haven't bitten me yet, you know. But they weren't going to bite. They, they, that something had happened to them or two and, and they, they, they had gone off. So at this point, um, you were at the raft, sitting in the raft? I, I got into the raft and I saw, for the first time, my mum and dad, the two boys, and Robin, looking very, very solemn and in shock. And they were, they were orange, because the, the canopy of the raft was orange. And it made them look orange. They looked like, like the Simpsons, if you like, mm -hmm. but before they were invented, they looked like orange people, you know? What was... And it was the canopy, the canopy of the yeah. raft was orange and the, the, the light shining through it made them look orange, you know. And this was our world. This was now our world, you know. What were your parents telling you? Well, my mum was a Christian and my dad was an atheist. I was an atheist too because I wanted to be like my dad. But <laughs> and my mind was about to change. And uh, my mum said, first of all, we... we We shared our stories so that we got a full picture of what had happened because me, only me and Sandy had seen the whales. Robin had been asleep at that time. The raft had now been tied to the dinghy. The dinghy had now been tied to the raft. I'd managed to save a sail and a, a sewing basket and some things that were to prove invaluable in the days to come. And now we'd been blown clear of the wreck site. And we watched... In fact, I didn't see Lucette go under... But uh, the twins had seen her go, you know, they, and the twins were crying. Mm -hmm. And my mum said to them, boys, don't cry. Don't be frightened. I think it was Sandy who said, mum, we're not crying because we're frightened. We're crying because we've lost Lucette. The boat for the two boat. years. Yeah. For two years had been our home. 
And now she'd gone. We felt extremely vulnerable out there in that little raft. And my mum said, I think we should say the Lord's Prayer. And I thought, I think I'll say the Lord's Prayer. And I turned to my dad and said, are you going to say the Lord's Prayer? And he said, no, I'm not going to say the Lord's Prayer. I don't believe in God. And I thought, my God, how can you be such a hard man at a time like this? You know, I said, Dad, we might be meeting God very soon. I said, don't you think that you could just say the Lord's Prayer? <laughs> and he said, Douglas, don't you think that if God was real, he'd know I was just saying the Lord's Prayer and it wouldn't count anyway? <laughs> and I thought, oh, God. you know, they, I said the Lord's Prayer and... We contemplated what had happened to us and what our options might be. What were the options? Well, Dougal had a flash of conscience himself over this. We said, Dougal, we now know what's happened and we know where we are. What we don't know is, do we have a chance, a chance to survive this? And Dougal wanted to lie to us. He wanted to tell us it was going to be all right. He said that he had to do battle with himself and decided to tell us the truth, whatever that truth was. He began to describe what had happened. We were 200 miles west of Cape Espinosa in the Galapagos Islands. We'd been hit by killer whales. We had sunk very quickly. We'd not had time to get any stuff off the yacht. The yacht had stayed upright till the end, so it allowed us all to get off. If we stayed where we were, we would drift 2,000 miles to the west at the rate of 25 miles a day, 100 miles every four days. I think that's 40, 40 days, 80 days, 80 days. We'd never survive 80 days. He was thinking of the options that we might, that might be before us. His plan B was that Douglas, myself, would take the dinghy, we would bail it out somehow, take the oars, take enough water for 10 days. The raft had water on it. It had 18 tins of water on it. So there was some water. We did have some water. That because was it was a, already in it. It was already in it. Yeah. And there was some glucose tablets and fortified bread. Okay. And uh, and then there was my mum's sewing basket. And there was the Genoa sail that I'd pulled on board. Yes. Uh, and in my mum's sewing basket was an amazing treasure trove of fish hooks, uh, cord, bit of copper wire, cloth, needle and thread, mm -hmm. glasses, a pair of glasses, and um, uh, things like that. So we, we, we'd, um, we didn't have much, but we had something, something, yes. something that we might be able to work with. Dougal's plan B was that I would take the dinghy. On your own? On my own, with 10 days supply of water. And just? And row back to the Galapagos Islands. And ask for help. And ask for help, raise the alarm. And I've explained to you that Dougal was like Captain Bly. You, you didn't argue with Dougal. <laughs> yes. Dougal would not be. He, he, it was his way or the highway. And I was just a young lad of 18 and a half, you know, a young man, you might say. Dougal said, this is, this is the only way we are going to be saved. And I said to him, for the first time in my life, I stood up to him. I said, I'm not going to do that, Dougal. I said, I would rather die here with you than die out there alone. And if I die, you will all die too. Now, I expected him to hit me mm -hmm. because that's what he did, but he didn't. And he looked at me and he said, I, I'm sorry, Douglas, for asking. I'm sorry for asking you. It is a fool's errand. You can't even see the Galapagos Islands. And just to get technical for a minute, the current away from the Galapagos Islands was two knots. The wind was another knot. That's 75 miles a day. It was blowing me to the west at 75 miles a day before I even row a stroke. And I've got to cover 75 miles a day, and then maybe maybe I could do 100 miles a day, maybe, as long as I don't stop rowing. I'm going to run out of water, aren't I, at some point? And I'd make 25 miles a day, 200 miles to go. It's eight days to get back there. And I said, it's too risky, Dad, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. So I would rather die here with you mm -hmm. than, than us be separated. And, and die separately. And so then we had to think of a plan another plan, C. a plan C. And I said, you know, Dad, do you remember coming back from Panama 
the doldrums. It rained heavily in the doldrums. The doldrums lies to the north of us here. I said there's rain, there's water there. There's rainwater. We can get rainwater, and with that rainwater we can survive. So we don't need food. We just need water. We can live for thirty days because thirty days seem like forever, and it would ne- it would definitely get picked up within thirty days. So we could survive for thirty days with no food and just with water. So. Dougal began to think about that. I mean, it's easy for me to talk. He had to make the decision. I said, let's, let's sail to the Pacific, to, to the doldrums. Now that will take us to the northwest, away from land, towards the center of the Pacific. I grant you that. And Dougal said, yeah, but there's the counter current flows back in the doldrums to the east. The counter current flows to the east. We'll catch the counter current. We'll, fly, we'll sail northwest to the center of the Pacific. We'll catch the counter current back to the uh, American coast. So there it was will, a plan. It will, it will take us a month or more. A bit vaguer. Yeah? We mm. didn't know what speed we might make. That's possibly a plan. And so we set sail. We, we decided we, wrote, we bailed out the dinghy, tied it to the raft as a towboat. We made a sail for it so it would tow us. When we'd saved those fishermen in Nassau, we towed their fishing boat under sail. We were under sail mm-hmm. as a sailing yacht yes. for, for towing a fishing boat. It looked ridiculous, you know, but it made good photography in the local papers in Nassau. And here we were again. We were going to tow the raft with the people in it, with the dinghy. Was there a sort of sense of fear at this moment? Oh, yeah. Yes? Uh, I mean, it seemed pointless at all times because we thought we we're never going to survive. Nobody lives through this. It's just a matter of time before something happens. We did not have expectation of life past a day, the day that we were in. Yes. And, you know, but we worked hard to keep surviving. People have asked me, what role did the twins play yeah, because in your they survival? Were so young. They were so young. Yes. And the answer to that is they kept us honest. They gave us a reason to survive, which was to get them home. They were just young kids. They, 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 my mum and dad felt that they hadn't even started their lives. I mean, I hadn't really, but uh, the twins were only 12. The food would be shared out equally. The water would be shared out equally. And that if we made a pact with each other, that if we were going to die, then we would die together. We would not eat each other. We'd not drink each other's blood. Is, was this a topic of conversation? Just once, when we made that agreement that that, that would be a rule, and including Robin, yeah, that, but that, that we would not eat him because he was a stranger in our house. Was he afraid of? I think he was a str- afraid of that, yeah, because he yeah. felt he was alone. But we said, no, you are part of our family, Robin. We will not forsake you. There's a famous law uh, called the custom of the sea, Although it was finally cast out in here in the UK, it was a law that applied also to Holland and also to around the world, navies around the world. It was customary to eat people on the raft. And a method had to be drawn up by which um, you could select the people to be eaten. And it was accepted that there was a method. So passengers were first. Women passengers and children passengers were the first of the passengers, then the male passengers, then the crew, then the officers, and the captain took no part in this process. But you must have this in Holland where you draw the short straw. Yeah, of course, but not that's to be where eaten. that comes from. Oh. That comes from the custom of the sea. I understand. Where you, you, you pulled out of the straws, mm-hmm. and the one who got the short straw was the one who was going to be eaten. And, and some of them did it bravely and some of them said they didn't want to die, you know, but they had to die because this was the custom of the sea. And if you did this, you couldn't be prosecuted if you survived by the uh, survivors Yes. because it was the custom of the sea. It was outlawed in about 1840 here in the UK because yeah. they, a, a, a famous yacht sank in the South Atlantic. It was picked up by a... German ship, but it landed the crew, the survivors, in the UK. So it was the sort of chain of uh, legal chain. Mm -hmm. It was all in the UK, so they could prosecute it. The captain and the two deckhands had 
consumed the cabin boy. They prosecuted them and made it outlaw. Yes. It was outlawed and said, this is murder and you can't, you can't do that. How did you manage to get some food? Was right. there like so, fish in the ocean? So we were in the raft and, you know, I had read a fiction book. Fiction. Mm -hmm. so, so not true, but it was a story about Alistair MacLean, a novel about some people who got shipwrecked and how they survived by drinking turtle blood. Let's just wind the clock back a little bit. I'll come to that one. So we made that we agreed on the plan that we would sail for water first, the doldrums that lay in the center of the Pacific. And I don't know if you have baths. I can't remember in Holland. I think you have showers, don't you? Do you have baths in Holland? Yeah, baths, you, baths, you know yes, what a bath? Yes, yeah, of course. You, if you push all the water up to one end of the bath, it all flows down back down the middle of the bath. Yes. Right? That happens in the Pacific Ocean because the tr trade winds blow all the water up to the western, right? it's now eastern because it's on the other side of the world, the Chinese coast, the, yes. the Australian coast, it blows all the wa water up there and the water builds uh, higher up, it's about 100 foot higher on the west of the Pacific, than it is on the east of the Pacific. Yes. So the water under gravity flows back down what's called the countercurrent. It's mm -hmm. one knot, a one knot current. That's 25 miles a day. So we knew that current was in the doldrums. So if we could get to the doldrums and get water, we could then sail, and I could row another 25 miles a day, say, right? That would be 50 miles a day we could row and get back to America that way. We would land somewhere in, South Amer in Central America. So that was our plan. We made this plan. And you know what? The plan worked bizarrely. Because you were like going to, yeah, like heading to the rain, but we were heading toward the rain. We reckoned it would take us 10 days to get to the rain, and we reckoned we had 10 days supply of water. What were the temperatures like? It was 30 degrees, mm -hmm. right? But in the rainstorms, it was bloody freezing. You know, it wasn't really freezing, but it was so cold that we shivered. So maybe the temperature dropped to 10 degrees or something like that yes. in those heavy rainstorms. But at night time, it was probably 20, 25, 25 maybe. And in the daytime, possibly even 30, 34 or something like that. We don't know, but it was, it was not uncomfortable other than in the rainstorms. So how many rain. days did it took until it started raining? Right, so I'm going to tell you about the sixth <laughs> day. The, on the sixth day, it rained in the morning. What's that? And uh, we were able to top up our tins. That You know, we'd open them tins. There was 18 tins of water. We were able to top them up, and we were able to drink some of the water. And uh, so it was a great day. This wonderful rain had come down and replenished our stocks. So we had enough to, water to get the 10 days. We now had enough water to make sure we definitely got to the doldrums. And uh, we were able to drink our fill because... We had agreed at the same conversation that we had said that um, we would not eat each other. We agreed that we would ration the water according to your needs. Take as much as you want. So take as much as you want, but not more than you need. Just try and restrict how much water you get, but you take a sip. And we pass the jar around maybe three or four times a day and you'd have one sip of water and pass the jar on. Some, some things had happened in that first week. We'd caught a dolphin, jumped into the boat. Wow. We caught it. Uh, a flying fish had jumped into the, in, into the boat. And we, we felt lots of niggles underneath our backsides as we were sitting in the raft that uh, were of small fish that were hiding under the raft and bigger fish were coming in underneath and catching them in the shade. They were hiding in the shade. I, I was telling you about this book that I'd read, uh, South by Java Head by Alistair MacLean. It was a fiction, a story of survival. But in it, they drank this turtle blood. On, on, a, on the second or the third day, this turtle came along. And I said, Dad, there's a, t there's a turtle here. And, and I read in a book, I didn't tell him it was a fiction book, I said, I read in a book that you can drink their blood. Dougal says, well, we are not going to be drinking turtle blood at this stage of the game, I can assure you of that. <laughs> how he was to change his mind. So we had to learn how to catch a turtle. 
So I had the paddle with the little brass bayonet connector on it. And this turtle came up and I thought, well, I'll just hit you on the head with this paddle and that'll kill you. Mm -hmm. So I hit him on the head. I remember his eyes filling up with blood and he swam off. And I thought, well, that, what's the point of swimming off? You're going to die anyway now. We had to catch these, hunt them. You can't just catch them. You can't just play at this. You have to hunt them down and catch and kill them if you're going to eat them because they're going to fight for their lives just as you are fighting for your lives. So the first one I hit and it swam away. And just at that point, you know what frigate birds are? Do you know what a frigate bird, a big black but yes. seabirds? And uh, there were the flying fish jumping out of the sea, skimming across the waves. And this big frigate bird came down and just caught this flying fish in its beak and flew off with it. <laughs> Before your... And Duke, me and Duke, my dad, looked at that and thought, I said, bloody hell, like, you know, it's like taking the piss. This is, I said, they've got millions of years on us. You know, we're humans, but we're here in this environment where they've got millions of years on us. And he, he said, yes, Douglas, but we have brains and we have got tools and we will catch food somehow. We don't know how yet, but we'll catch it. So that's, that inspired the catching of the turtle that failed. Then along came another turtle. And I thought, well, I'm not going to let him swim away. So I'm going to grab him. Then he can't swim away. But, of course, you, these are, are beasts and they're powerful. Yes, they're big. And uh, this turtle comes along and I grabbed him like this and pulled him over the side of the raft. And now he's chopping me with his <gasps> flippers like this. Mm. He's chopping like this. And I'm going, bloody hell. And, uh, and so I throw him into the raft. <gasps> And now everybody jumps out of the out of the raft into the sides of the raft, and this turtle with his sharp beak and his sharp claws is flapping around in the in the uh, raft, and Dougal picks it up and throws it out through the forward entrance, and off goes the turtle. Yeah, because it was so, too dangerous to too have dangerous. these yeah, knives yeah, yeah, in the yeah. it was like it, was, it reminded me of a fox and chickens in yes. a hen house, and all the chickens jump out of the way, and and um, but so. Number two failed. I thought, right, number three, we will tie him up in a rope because there was a little rope on the side of the raft. We'll tie him up in that and then he can't escape. Then we'll kill him and, and, and see, what, see what's inside this turtle. Turtle number three came along and it worked, went to plan. We, we caught him. We transferred him over to the dinghy, which I'd now bailed the dinghy out, so we had the dinghy towing the raft. And... Uh, We, we killed him, mm -hmm. cut his throat. And I said, don't forget to try the blood. <laughs> and uh, Dougal tasted the blood. And he said, it's not salty. And we had the first inkling that we could live off these turtles if we could just catch enough of them. What we didn't know was the reason why the turtles came to us. But we did find out later on in the, in the survival that they thought we were another turtle And they, they, their purpose was mating, because if if the if there were more than one turtle around us, we noticed that if they mated, they both swam off and disappeared. But if there was only one turtle, it would come over to us to look to see if you know. I don't know what turtles mm -hmm. do for mating purposes, whether they're suitably matched or whatever, you know. But um, so we found that it discovered it was a mating urge that brought them to us. But we come back to the sixth day when it rained and our connection with Holland in this particular adventure. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, we saw a ship. A ship sailed, was sailing directly towards us. And we thought, my God, it's a ship going to be rescued. This is it. You know, we've done six days. We've got away with this. You know, we haven't really had to you know, yes. suffer any privations of, of thirst or hunger. And if we get picked up now, we're going to survive. This ship was a Dutch ship. And the name of that ship was the Strat Cook from the Royal Dutch Indonesian Steamship Company. And I'm afraid to say that uh, she sailed on by. And my dad fired two parachute flares. But, you know... Ships of that era, the second mate was working the site out in the chart room. He'd have radar, 
they wouldn't be looking for a small boat. We, we hadn't had time to send an SOS off. I said to, dad, to my dad, I said, look, dad, fire the flare straight at the ship. It, and my dad was a sea captain, former sea captain. He said, I can't do that, Douglas. They could have explosives on deck. We could sink them. And I said, well, that's okay, because they'll send an SOS out. And then we get And they'll come and rescue together, them, yeah. and then they can rescue us at the same time. Yeah. And he said to me, Douglas, you, you, I do not like the way you're thinking. Okay. You know, you're, you've got a, like an evil... It's too selfish. Uh, yeah, yeah, too selfish, you know. I understand. And, and I said, well, I don't care. I still think you should <laughs> fire the damn flare at it, you know. Up until then, we'd been hoping for rescue. But now we realised that there was no guarantee of rescue. And that the only, the only real chance that we had was to survive. Somehow we had to survive mm -hmm. long enough to hit land. And to do that, we needed water, we needed food. With the turtle meat, we, we learned that we could dry it. Ah. And we could keep it like, you know, I mean, the Icelanders and the Norwegians, mm -hmm. they, dry, they dry, dry meat. Dry the meat and, and just yeah, eat it. And, and eat it, yeah. And we, we figured we could dry it. We, with a fat, we could render the fat down into oil, and we could um, we could make uh, some balming fluid to rub on our skins. We 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 got covered in boils, you know, in that raft. Because we, of the sun or the no, sea? No salt. The salt. salt. Yes. And we got immersion fud. We were going back to this bath story again. If you're in the bath for too long, your your hands go white yes. and they swell, and they, they you get this white crossled sort of effect on your hands mm -hmm. and your feet. If you can imagine that times a hundred, that's what you get in a life raft. You get this great pain in your hands and feet. So living on the raft was not easy. No, I understand. And, and the bellows that we used to blow up the raft had stopped working, so we had to blow it up by mouth. Every night the raft deflates because of atmospheric pressure. And every day in the heat of the sun, it is like really hard and stretches the raft. Yes. So you, you, the, the raft is going through this process every day, and uh, that was wearing the raft out. And now we couldn't keep it inflated properly because we had to blow it up by mouth. And so therefore we were, we were not as fastidious about it as we should have been. And um, so, so the raft was deteriorating daily now. So the sixth day we had reached a resolution that we, the only way we were going to survive was if we saved enough food and enough water, and made us a plan. We now knew we were doing about two knots. That's 50 miles a day. We had to sail north to the doldrums. We could continue the two knots. Even when the wind died down near the uh, American coast, we could still make two knots, we thought, 50 miles, maybe 25 miles a day. We worked that out to be 75 days. We had to survive on this raft for 75 days. And we just looked at each other and thought, there's no way on earth we're going to survive 75 days. Yes, in this little rough. In this little boat. this little we dungeon just, on the side. just cannot do it. So we didn't give up, but for the first time, we realised the enormous task that lay before us. The next major event to happen was we were constantly blowing the raft up, trying to keep it inflated. Yes. But we had learned to catch turtles, and we caught quite a few turtles, they have veins and arteries. Mm -hmm. If you cut the artery, the blood was bright red and it filled the glasses, the, the, the tumbler quickly, and you could drink that. Right? But if you cut a vein, it came slowly out and it coagulated and turned into a solid. And the solid blood on the top of it had a serum. Yeah. It's called serum. Yeah. It's a, so you know, so it's, it's separated. And with that serum, we could make a stew. And we made a stew out of the dried meat <laughs> and this serum. And it tasted, it, was really, it tasted fantastic, yeah. you know, especially as we, did, we, we didn't eat uh, very much anyway. And, and if you mix that with turtle eggs, mm -hmm. we had this, from the female turtles, you had this fantastic stew that we made. Mm -hmm. And um, from the dolphins that we caught, we emptied their bellies and ate the food that they'd ate. Uh -huh. It was like cooked food because it was partially digested. So... We, we did have a variety of diet, but it was all fish, you know what I mean? Was it and a lot? No. 
No, yeah. because now it sounds like you yeah, like. It sounds like a yeah. banquet. <laughs> but was it but like one it, turtle every couple of days? Yeah, or? yeah. We caught thirteen turtles, so one every three or four days. Okay, and you had to and, share and it with the six of you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it wasn't and that yeah, much. Yeah, it wasn't that much. It was a few mouthfuls. Yeah. Yeah. The next stage, after the sixth day, when the ship had gone past us, and we'd made this resolution that we would sail on to America, yeah. seventy-five days. We were still going to the doldrums to get water. And we had great expectations mm -hmm. that we would get water. The, the raft began to deteriorate rapidly. And I'm afraid the raft didn't make it. The raft itself, the bottom dropped out of the raft on the 17th day. And we, we had to abandon the raft and get into the dinghy only. How small was the dinghy? And, and the dinghy was big enough for three men, three people. But there were six of us yes. and a turtle. And our stuff, you know, the box, a box of stuff and my mum's sewing basket and the paddles and, the, you know, all the bits yeah. of paraphernalia we'd managed to save. We, we decided it was too dangerous to actually leave the raft and that we would stay in the raft a bit longer, even though we were now covered in boils and immersion fat. And I want to share something to tell you about the character of my mother. Because the fish kept chewing the underneath of the bloody raft, it filled with water. Mm -hmm. And because our bodies displace water, if you sit in water, you displace that water. And we were sitting in a raft, but we displaced the water in the sea beneath us. And the water came up to our chests because it was only two inches deep. But if you sat in that, you went down and the water came up. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were constantly buried in this bloody water that was... That was Rubbing our bodies of heat. Because also there was not enough space in the dinghy. There, there, there was not enough space in the raft. In rafts, the raft. yeah. We didn't go in the dinghy to start yeah. with. We used that as a towboat. Yeah. So we, and we, want, we lived under the canopy to keep the yes. sun off us uh, inside the raft. But gradually the raft was deteriorating. And we were up to our chests in water. We were cold. We were shivering. And there was one dry place on the raft. And that was the central thwart. You could lie on that. Mm -hmm. And so we allowed ourselves one hour and then we rotate. You could lie on the thwart for an hour. Then you had to get off, get back in the water and let somebody else have a turn on the, on the thwart. So everybody had one hour to we had rest one hour and to go rest back and, and see. Perhaps go to sleep, yeah. But my mum, God bless her, said to me and the twins and to Robin, you can have my turn. And we quite selfishly took that turn. But now, of course, I think back to my mum sitting in that water, cold, for the sake of her children, you know. Uh, she was a strong woman, a strong, strong woman. My dad was a strong man, but my mum was kind of soft power. She yeah. was soft power, you know. Makes you emotional? Yeah. Because you miss her? No, but you think of the sacrifice that she made. Mm -hmm. And I carry that with me today. I make sacrifices for my children because she made sacrifices for us. But she made real a real sacrifice because she stayed in the water cold and and let us take her turn on the, on the thwart. And uh, so living in the raft was getting intolerable. We couldn't, we couldn't survive much longer with the water, the cold, the immersion for the boils that we were covered in. And then, we, as I said to you, we were, we, were towing the, we were towing the raft with the dinghy. And then one day, the wire snapped and the dinghy went off on its own, sailing away into the distance. And my dad knew instinctively that we needed that dinghy. And, you know... We hadn't eaten or drink for for ten days, but he dived out of the boat, out of the raft, and swam after the dinghy and caught it. It's crazy. And and it, it took him maybe two hours to get back to us, but the swimming lasted about five minutes or three minutes or four minutes, not very far, but it completely exhausted him. And the sharks were swimming behind him because... We didn't see the sharks. We didn't know that the sharks were constantly in attendance until the raft had actually sank and we were now living in the dinghy because now suddenly we could see. We weren't, 
we weren't in that canopy, covered by that canopy anymore. We could see all the sea around us. And these sharks have been following us for quite a number of, in fact, probably since when, we, when we'd been shipwrecked. But Dougal did survive that. He, he got the dinghy and he pulled the dinghy back and, uh, and uh, we resolved that we would check the gear more, you know, because we couldn't afford to lose that dinghy. But I never thought that we would lose the raft, though. But on the 17th day, we decided that the life was not tenable on the, on the raft and we would get into the dinghy. And uh, then we had second thoughts about it and thought, well, we'll leave it another day. But then the floor fell out of the di uh, raft. Mm -hmm. So now the f we had no floor to sit on. So we had to abandon the dinghy. And we abandoned the dinghy on the 17th day and we all got into the raft, into the dinghy. Mm -hmm. And we were now, this was our only craft. And the worry was that if we sank that, we couldn't refloat it. Whereas the, the the raft couldn't be sank. Yes, because you can refloat it, it again. Because we, we can, we it, it wouldn't even if it was full of water, it wouldn't yes. sink. But the the dinghy would be different, so we had to be very careful. And at the same time that we were transferring from the raft to the dinghy, I remember a big turtle came along, weighed about seventy pounds, and Dougal said, "Look." It'll test the dinghy anyway, you know, if we can catch the, if we can get all of us and the turtle in. <laughs> he said, look, there's no need to pass up a good meal just because we're moving house, you know. So we decided we would catch this turtle at the same time and we caught the turtle and, and killed it and, and, and ate that as well, on that, all on that same day, on the 17th day. But then we watched the dinghy, the raft float away, the rip bits, we cut the flotation jet, that thwart that we mum, my mum mm -hmm. lay on, we cut that and bent it round the front of the um, the, dinghy. the dinghy to keep give it some buoyancy. Yes. And uh, we watched the, the other bits float away into the Pacific and we, we felt loss about that because that raft had saved our lives and undoubtedly without that, without the Icelanders giving us that raft, mm -hmm. we would never have survived. And it had brought us this far. It had brought us 17 days. Yes. And now we were, had to go on the ra uh, on the dinghy alone. It was open, so the wa rain would fall on us and, and the elements, the wind, would get us directly. So there, there were disadvantages, yes. but it was dry. We could keep it dry. And uh, for that we were extremely grateful because the raft was wet and it, we were up to our chests in water. Mm -hmm. But that, 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 the dinghy was not going to be like that. Anyway, so on the 17th day we sailed on. We still hadn't got to the doldrums. Where, was the, where were the doldrums? We were supposed to have been there after 10 days. We still hadn't got there. We weren't quite sure of our position. I remember one night uh, I saw a star, the North Star. You can only see the North Star in the Northern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. We had sank two degrees south, and you can only see the North Star about five degrees north. We're almost in the doldrums. We, we've been slower. We've gone slower than we thought. We are not there yet. But that gives and hope. There was hope, yeah. And, and the, the next night, you know these pink, fl cl these fluffy clouds of the trade winds? They're all the same every day, you know, the, the blue sky, mm -hmm. fluffy clouds, little cotton clouds blowing across the sea. But that next night we saw a, a thick layer of cloud coming from the north, going south, the opposite direction to the, the clouds, the, the trade wind clouds. I remember my dad saying, those clouds have come from the doldrums. We are getting close. And I said, will, will it rain tonight, Dad? And he said, I don't know if it will rain tonight. He said, but we are getting close to the doldrums. And I said, yeah, but we need the rain tonight, Dad. Because there was no water left. Yeah, there was very little water left. And he said, Douglas, I'm not a bloody prophet. I can't tell you whether it will rain to not or not. But a change in the wind means a change in the weather. And we have got a change in the wind here, a change in the clouds. It might rain. It might just rain. It didn't. Got to the doldrums, the area we're a bit, bit north, two or three days, and we thought we'd made the biggest mistake that we could possibly make because there's no way back now. 
We, no. we, we had committed to this and the rain hadn't come. And uh, we knew that if it didn't rain soon, then it would be too late. Probably the second or third day after we would got to the doldrums, it rained. And it rained heavily. And we were so happy to have that rain. For us, it meant life. That we were going to su survive, at least. Our hope, our hope sprung mm -hmm. up again. That we would, uh, we might make it. We might just make it. With the rain, now we've just got to make sure we've got the counter current. And we'll be going back towards land. Mm -hmm. You know? We were to experience very heavy rain in the, in the few days that were ahead of us. We had no clothes on. So we were very cold when it rained heavily. Why did, didn't you have clothes on? You just they, left they just rotted away from us. Okay. They rotted away. Yes. And in, in, when we were in the raft in that water all the time, yeah. the clothes just disappeared. Naked. Yes. Yeah. So my mum had her house coat on because it was made of nylon or rayon, some kind of false, some kind of man-made material. Mm -hmm. But everybody else's clothes, it's just sort of... So good. Well, my mum... We could see they were rotting away. My mum, being my mum, said, we'll take them off and keep try and keep them. Yes. For, for if it gets cold or if we hit land even, we will need to wear something. We, we began to collect water and we shivered in the cold rain and we sang <laughs> to keep warm because it vibrates your body, you know. Yes. It makes you feel warm. And I made some capes out of the bits of the raft. I made little coats that we could wear that would keep the wind off us, you know. And the lightning came down and, you know, it was pretty, we didn't dare curse the rain because this rain was going to keep us alive. So we were in for some choppy weather and I, I, I remember one night when it was raining so heavily and the sea was so, so rough and my dad could not, he was steering the boat stern first and he could not leave the sail because of the, we were so low down in the water we were bailing, Robin was bailing, and my mum was bailing, and I was scooping the water out with my hands. From, from our, We put this sort of canopy over us to keep the rain off us. And, um, and Dougal had had enough. My dad had had enough. Back in those first days when, when we'd been shipwrecked, uh, another bargain, another agreement we made was that we would not give up till we were on a steamer home. We, my, my dad said, I will, I will try my best, and I will not give up till I get you boys on a steamer home. And that that had also been like a contract, a promise that he yes. made to us, you know. And now, for the first time, he was questioning whether that was possible in this weather, the rain, the wind. The waves. And, and the waves and the water pouring on. And it would just take one big wave and we were done for. Dougal said that he felt... You know, the hard thing about survival is trying to survive, trying to keep that mind going, saying, I'm going to, I will, I will suffer this, I will suffer that, I will go through this, I will try and survive. Yeah, keep the spirit alive, yeah. Yeah, but my dad was ready to give up. It was easier to die. Mm -hmm. And my mum caught his eyes in the, in the, in the lightning and, said, and held his eyes. You made a deal. We have these boys to save. And Dougal, he said he found resolve from that to carry on, that he would carry on and he would try harder. And he bailed, and it, and it, but the rain was ter terrific, terrifically hard rainstorms. And, um, but the days went by and uh, we collected water and we collected turtles. And one day we caught a shark, a big five foot shark that we got, got its eye hooked, caught on the hook. We made tools to catch fish with. We had become really innovative about, uh, and, and we, we caught quite a few Dorado, big sports fish. We, we found a way of just hooking them right, in, right behind the eye. With your We'd hands? Them. No, with the, uh, we made a gaff. Wow. We made a tool yes. out of bits of wood. Of the, of the, so my dad did that, but extremely innovative. Yeah. If there's anybody you want to get cast adrift with, it would, it be, would be Dougal. Doodle. It would yeah. be Dougal. He, he sure. never gave up. He had the courage of a lion and he, he, he worked constantly trying to make tools out of things with which we could catch fish. Mm -hmm. 
We counted the days and Dougal kept his logbook. And uh, then an accident happened. On the 25th day, the knot holding the water bag came undone. A turtle caught it with its flipper as we were trying to kill it, as we were killing it. And um, we lost all our water. Oh, no. This and must we were have devastated. So... We were absolutely devastated. And we, we'd started to drift out of the doldrums now because we were getting close to land. Yes. But we didn't dare think about that. But that that was the only reason why the doldrums were, were beginning to tail off and the violent thunderstorms had stopped happening. Robin had been the last person to tie the knot, so he, he got blamed for it quite unfairly. And uh, Dougal said he would not forgive him until that, that water bag was filled again. And uh, because all our lives depended on it. If we fast forward now, and we come to the 38th day. It rained heavily that morning and the bag was filled. We were secure. There was a great feeling of security. We had saved a lot of food. We were going to start rowing that night. The, w the weather was calming down. I had done some rowing, but... We were going to. I was going to do a watch, a four-hour watch mm -hmm. of rowing, in which we'd covered maybe twenty-five miles. That was the plan, and uh, I was a good rower, a very good, st a strong. I was a very strong kid, uh, young man, and I, I felt I could do that for four hours a night. But came the thirty-eighth day, and we'd filled the uh, uh, the water bag at last, and uh, Robbie was extremely grateful for that. He sort of discharged his obligation, you know. And um, we were talking again about food and what we would do when we got home. We thought we'd open a cafe because opening this cafe, we talked about it for many days. Would provide you with well, we could talk about food. food yeah, yeah. yeah, we had endless subjects yes. about what kind of food we would make, and we talked in great detail about food. What was the name of the cafe? At Dougal's Kitchen. Of course, it would yeah. be called Dougal's Kitchen in in our hometown of Leek. Yeah. We would open it. Dougal was just sort of talking about whether we should get a wine license for this cafe. I mean, it was a cafe, not a bloody restaurant, Dougal, you know, but we'd get, in our fantasy, everything exists. Of course, yes. And uh, he said, there's a ship out there. And I said, a ship, Dad? Did you say there's a ship out there? He said, yes. He says, there's a ship out there. And I said, let me look, you know, because we didn't trust each other. We had, like, you know, it's, it's, your, your willpower is so bad. Yes. And I, I said, it is a ship, Dad. It's a ship. So we flares, we better get the flares ready. And so suddenly, action stations, we might get rescued. And we had two hand flares left. And Dougal lit the first hand flare and nothing happened. The ship didn't alter course. Would this be a repeat of the, of the start coup? Or, and she, she, she sort of squealed in the seaway. We had one flare left all hangs on this one and he lit the flare and he held it up like this and it, there was no wind in, and they, the flux was dropping down onto his hands burning his hands like this and he, he sort of held on and it, till he could hold no more and they threw it away and that bit where it made that arc in the sky it was seen by the helmsman of the Japanese fishing boat and he thought because they could see a sort of a clump of something in the sea mm -hmm couldn't be life on that and then he saw the flare they thought well and we saw her alter course maybe 20 degrees but not directly towards us then she altered another 20 there's no doubt about it she must be coming to pick us up and Dougal looked at her and he looked at us and he said I think our ordeal is over I think we're going to be rescued and the Tokamaru the ship's name to Tokamaru sailed closely by and there they looked at us i mean they couldn't believe their eyes and and they, they said do you want to come on board and i thought how can they think we don't want to come <laughs> on board so maybe they think we're sailing like we're contiki expedition or something like that we said no we we want to come on board and they threw this rope a dirty oily smelly rope across onto the dinghy and I grabbed it and I looked at that rope and I thought this rope does not belong to our world this belongs to another world 
And it's a world that we, we are going to go back to. This, like, because I'm holding this rope, means we've been rescued. But it's like your mind can't take it in that you've actually survived this ordeal. It's almost over, you know. My mum, of course, she'd saved our clothes. She said, Douglas, you'd better get dressed. If we, if we are going to be rescued, you'd <laughs> yes. better put some trousers on. And so, so, but I didn't have any trousers. They'd completely rotted away. So I, but I did have a shirt. And she said, well, you put your shirt on at least. And so I put this shirt on. And Robin put his swimming trunks on and his shirt on. Anyway, the Japanese hauled us on board. Eager hands hauled us on board over the side. And they were going to sink the dinghy. And Dougal asked them not to. He said, please save it. Why? I don't know why. I understood that we wanted to keep it because it had saved our lives. But we didn't need to take it with us. But Dougal wanted to keep it. And the captain said, OK, bring it on board. Now the dinghy lies in the National Maritime Museum. And the few artifacts that were in the dinghy are in the National Maritime Museum too. That's beautiful. Thank God yes. he saved it. Because that is what has made the story live through the genera through my dad's generation, through my generation, is the fact that you can go to the National Maritime Museum and actually see the dinghy that we survived in. It's tiny. It is tiny. We, we had survived 38 days adrift in the Pacific with no food or water, very little from what we had in the raft to start with. We caught the turtles, we'd caught the dolphins, we'd caught a shark. We had, uh, we had sailed 750 miles. And you know what? We were six days off the South American coast when we got picked up. We very nearly, our plan very nearly worked. What was like the conversation you had with each other? Was it like, were you happy or exhausted? Or we, uh, Dougal put in his book, and, and I repeated it in mine, The Last Voyage of the Lucerne. We would never share a pinnacle of contentment like that again in this lifetime. It's not possible when, you know, you've been, you've been shipwrecked. You've lost the boat, and you've sailed for 38 days in an open boat and survived somehow. And somebody has given you a life back. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't thank the Japanese enough for what they had done in saving us. We were sitting on the deck of the Tokamaru, looking back out at the Pacific Ocean around us. And we thought we had mastered the ocean. The Savage Sea, that's where Dougal's book t title came from, Survive the Savage Sea. We had survived the Savage Sea. The sea doesn't take prisoners. You, you, there's no failures in survival school. There's only deaths. And yet somehow we had survived. And we felt that we missed it. We missed, I'll tell you what we missed. The ultimate reward that you get from surviving for another day, when you think you're going to die at any moment, and you live another day, and you go, yay. Yes. And I know what a man in Africa feels like when he doesn't get eaten by a lion. You know, he, he sort of lived another day. He's escaped death another day. And that is a very high feeling. Mm. So we, we had this very high feeling, this very sad feeling that we, the Pacific, we had been saved and we were going back to civilization. And that um, we had no need now of the Pacific Ocean. We were just going back to our world. But, but this ocean had kept us alive, you know, with all its resources and, uh, and our ability to exploit those resources. How was it coming back to life? Like, do you take care, like eating in little small bites? Or well, how do not you... me. Not me. Oh. I mean, well, first, the Japanese were very careful with us. The first thing they said is, shower, shower, because <laughs> we smelled really bad of blood and rotting flesh and yes. all that. And we had showers in the... They, with the, they had a big bath, a big sort of uh, hot bath. And we all bathed in that so nice not to feel the pressures of the dinghy against us you know that the, the it's causing sores and things like that and we floated around in this water and we just laughed we laughed burst into laughter we'd survived we were alive we'd survived we had survived and we were alive and we could have a coffee <laughs> i had a coffee on that tokamaru and i thought back about that coffee on the that my dad had made and thought well 
us 38 days, but we did get the coffee <laughs> in the end. And then we docked in Panama, Panama City at uh, two or three o'clock in the morning. And the world press were there to meet us. And uh, I always remember my mother learning three words in Japanese to say goodbye to the Japs. She says, I'm going to say these words. Kazaku, arigato, sayonara. What does it mean? It means we will not forget you. Thank you and goodbye. And of course, comes the moment to say this as we're leaving. And she says, Douglas, I can't remember those three words. Can you <laughs> say them, please? I said, Mum, I haven't even been learning them. How the hell am I ever going to say them? But somehow, because I was listening to her uh, repeating them over, it stuck in my head. And, and so I said that to them. And, and there were a lot of tears. You know, when you shared a, an experience like that, they, they never leave you. Those, those feelings never leave you. You, they, you carry them for the rest of your life. And... Uh, it took, it took us 20 years to get over that, for, for to stop thinking and seeing that blue of the Pacific Ocean and remembering those. But if we go down, we just went down to the museum for the 50th anniversary. So that's 50 years ago. And we looked at the dinghy. And I remember every little mark on that dinghy. And I looked at the dinghy and I saw those marks and remembered the intimacy of that, you the know, moments, of the yeah. moments and of the sights that, uh, yeah, we survived. Nobody died. We came very close to it. And uh, my brother, Sandy, had pneumonia when we got picked up. So maybe he wouldn't have lived for much longer. We maybe wouldn't have all got to that landfall. And um, they, uh, we went. he went to hospital and had some, uh, well, we all went, but we had some tests carried out. Of course. Our blood level, our hemoglobin was extremely low in our, even though we'd been drinking blood, you'd think that, that would make it, the blood rich, but it didn't. And uh, we'd lost a lot of weight. I'd lost uh, maybe uh, 20 kilos, maybe. I looked That's skeletal. Yes. Like all the bones were sticking out. We'd lost a lot of weight. And we'd all lost weight. And my dad had written a logbook, and he, he was determined to write a book. And he did. He wrote a book called The Survivors of the Savage Sea. It became a worldwide bestseller with the proceeds. He never worked again for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. With the proceeds of just that one book that was 12 weeks number one of the New York Times bestsellers list. That's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. He, he managed to buy a farm in the Midlands that we still have today. And he bought a, um, another yacht. And set off around the world again on his yacht. No, you're kidding. Yeah, he did. Yeah, but he never didn't get very far. He got to the Mediterranean and thought, "Sod this! I'm just going to sit in the Zia Marina in Greece and and be comfortable," you know. But there was still this love for the ocean. Yeah, you yeah. all had to share. Yeah, yeah. He, I, well, I joined the merchant navy and sailed at sea for um, ten years. Yeah. After that, the uh, the twins went to school, back to school, and I always remember my brother Sandy saying to me. There I was sitting in the classroom talking about science or maths or English. But all I could think about was the Pacific Ocean and our time on the Pacific. And I'd never thought about how it must be for them to return to that mundanity of life when they'd done, had such a great adventure. I say to my dad, my dad died in 1992. Uh, but I say to him every day, thank you, Dougal, for, for taking us on that trip. Because it also and, shaped your life. Yeah, it shaped my life. And, and, thank, and thank you, Dougal, for standing by your words to get us on a steamer home. And I have learned in my life now mm -hmm. to live by that code of saying what is right and doing what is right, making decisions and Standing firm, you know, it's, it's so easy to give up if something doesn't quite go your way. And uh, if we'd have done that, we would have all been dead. But we never gave up. You know. I have been sitting here for two hours just listening and having so much respect for having everything you survived. What will be like your last lesson you learned from all of this to all the listeners at home? Yeah, never give up. 
never, ever give up. No matter how bleak it may seem, no matter how bad things may appear, you must keep trying and you might succeed. And as my mother said, you know, back in those first day on the raft when we were discussing what had happened, she said, we'd rather die trying than just sit here and die. You know, we want to try, do we? So what can we do? Mm-hmm. And this is when we came up with those plans about what we could do. So never give up and just keep trying. And, you know, that applies to your life, your everyday life. And I think I, I, I shared with you downstairs about my son Joshua. He had a motorbike crash in Australia. He was in a coma for three months. He was unconscious for another month after that. He's permanently damaged. But I remember flying out to Australia that night and I thought about Dougal and the raft. And I thought to myself, Douglas, as Dougal saved your life, you now have to save your son's life somehow. I know you don't know how, but you've got to learn how. Mm -hmm. And you've got to somehow save his life. So I carry that with me, that strength and that power that such a thing gives to you in that you must Mm -hmm. never give up, you know. And I'm happy to say that Joshua lives with us and he came around and he's badly damaged, but he's alive and he's happy, isn't he, Dil? (laughs) He's happy. He's happy to be alive. Yes. And, uh, you know. But that's all down to yeah. survive the savage sea, you know. It's all down to this. What happened? Thank you so much for sharing your story of hope and determination. And I am amazed to learn how little our body needs to function and stay alive. And also found it truly inspiring, the connection made by all of you. Thank you all for listening to Day Survives. Let us know what you think of this episode. If you're inspired by this unique and extraordinary survival story, please follow or subscribe to our podcast and check out our social media for more stories like these. Until next time, take care and don't miss the next episode. It affects roughly one in 2,300 births in the UK of what they call spontaneous mutations. It sort of just happens. Eight was when I had my, my first surgery. I'm about to have my 40th. That was like the comic book, D&D, magic tricks kind of guy. Seems like I should have been burnt alive at birth. You think of surgery as, as a quick fix and a, a solution to all our problems. And we don't focus on the, um, the psychology of, of the whole thing. Because it, it's a process to have to go through. Yes. Like after 40, it kind of, that is you.